Hey there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 783. That is 783 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. I really, 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 really do. Have I been? Pretty good, all things considered, I cannot complain. I've actually just got back from the gym um, a few hours ago. This has been recorded on a Sunday. Um, it, it, what, it was recorded on the Sunday, on the 2nd of June, and I'm also going to be recording it way into the 3rd, so you'll probably be hearing a bit of Sunday thoughts, a bit of Monday thoughts, and then I'm going straight out for a run. So I'm feeling good, I'm feeling charged, I'm feeling very motivated this month to go after and achieve the things that I need to achieve in order to get myself out of poverty and into that gold house with that gold Lamborghini and those gold Air Force Ones. You know the deal, you know the deal. Man, over the past weekend, watch Real Madrid win the Champions League once again. Obviously, no surprise there for those of you that do watch football. But it was unfortunately a really sad match for Borussia Dortmund because they actually had a chance of winning. They actually squandered quite a few chances against Real Madrid. They probably were the better team for about 60, 70 minutes of that game. And then, of course, as great teams always do, if you give them a chance, if you let them stay in the game, they're always going to punish you. And I feel like even as a neutral or even Dortmund fans, you probably got the feeling that they knew because they didn't go into that second half with a 1-0 win or with a 1-0 lead. And because they didn't come out of the block straight away in the second half and get a quick goal, they were probably back of their head thinking, you know what, we're going to lose this. They were probably thinking that. And the moment that they gave, the moment they conceded a header, I thought in particular, because I thought they defended pretty well. I didn't really see them getting beat on a set play. If anything, I saw Bridget Dortmund maybe getting, conceding a goal against Real Madrid through like an individual moment of brilliance. You know, um, uh, Vinicius Jr., Rodrigo, uh, Jude Bellingham, Tony Cruz, whatever. I just expected one of those guys to just pull something out of the hat. And of course, that would then lead um, to um, Bruce Real Madrid taking the lead. But, Actually, the worst thing for them happened. One of the smallest players on the pitch, um, Carvajal, actually ended up scoring a header. Very good, very well taken header, actually, from a set piece where he ran across the defender. One of my favorite type of headers, to be fair. I'm a big fan of diving headers. I'm a big fan of bullet headers. And I'm a big fan of the glancing headers when you run across your defender. Because suddenly you're not there, then you're there, and the ball's already in the net. Do you know what I mean? It's that quick, instant um, effect of it. And usually, sometimes what it takes is a deftness of touch because usually the ball's coming in with a lot of space and all you're doing is sort of like redirecting it. And it's, I don't know, I just love, I just love headers like that. And Danny Carvajal, one of the shortest players on the pitch, was able to jump in front of his man, head the ball um, into the back top corner. Um, and that was obviously before he did send him a warning. He did exactly the same thing beforehand and he just missed. Actually, I think the goalkeeper might have saved it or it went just over. And of course, he scored a second time. And then by then, Bruce Dortmund had to open themselves up. They had to go for the goal. And then, of course, that opened him up on the counter, which then led to Vinicius Jr.'s very good finish. To be fair, the finish wasn't the greatest, but I thought the build-up play and the way he received the ball and the way he finished it is what led to the goal. Like, he took that chance of intent, even though he didn't mean what he did because he kind of scuffed it. The ball comes to Jude Bellum in the middle and he passes out wide to Vinicius Jr. And you can see in his brain, he kind of takes it with one foot, right foot, lets it come across his body, and he just puts his foot through the ball, but it kind of scuffs and it hits the ground. But that hit in the ground is what allows the ball to bounce over the goalkeeper's arm and go into the corner. So it wasn't the most, like, you know, whatever, but I think the intent at which he received the ball, because even when he was running, like, everything about Vinicius Jr., like, he's almost like the, the complete opposite of, like, a Garnacho, right, at, at the moment. He's very raw, definitely not the finished product, and incredibly greedy. Vinicius Jr. was kind of like that when he first joined Real Madrid, but now he's just, his output, his delivery, his finishing is just top level. Like, even throughout the game, he he, he was put in the pocket. I forgot who the, who the Borussia Dortmund right-back was, but for the majority of the game, he had Vinicius Jr. In, the, in his right pocket. Let's not fucking lie. He fucking pocketed him the entire game. But Vinicius Jr. just kept going at him, kept going at him. And this particular chance, he stayed wide. Um, Bellingham got the ball. And Bellingham's ball, to be fair as well, was very, very good. Because it just was past... It was kind of a ball that was fed within Vinicius Jr.'s path. He didn't have to go behind. He didn't have to run too far ahead. It was just in the in the way of his kind of running. 
he received the ball drags it onto his left foot and just the intent the idea that i'm gonna sh i'm gonna score because sometimes i don't know if you guys know this but if you play football you play any type of sport you can tell when somebody doesn't really believe in what they're doing i think the same thing with any walk of life a job interview a presentation you know whatever you're trying to you know negotiate a fucking promotion you have to go in there with a bit of intent you have to believe into in your core you know at a fucking cellular level that yeah i deserve this and Vinicius Jr. knew he was going to score. He knew he was going to either worry the goalkeeper or he was going to score. But I, I felt more scoring. Like he saw that chance as an opportunity to kill the game, which it obviously did. It kind of took all the momentum, all the steam out of the game. And, you know, after that, they were just kind of running the clock down. So that's what I loved seeing. The Jude Bellingham over love has been quite nauseating. I'm not going to lie. To see his full PR machine in effect. Even though he's a very impressive young man, 20 years old, 21-ish years old. He's been in Spain for like, what, less than 12 months. He's already fluent in Spanish to the point where he can answer interview questions at the end of the game. And not just like, you know, there's probably a script you can answer from an interview, especially if it's like a Real Madrid TV presenter or something. But he's answering like regular interview questions from like the pundits and like the, you know, press conferences and shit after the game. Wild. So he's definitely a very impressive dude. He's come in, scored a bunch of goals, become a linchpin in that team. And maybe Jude Bellingham's introduction to Real Madrid is what basically led to, you know, Tony Cruz saying, you know what, I want to hang up my boots. Maybe I want to go out on the top because these young kids are coming in. Let me give them some space to shine. And obviously he didn't want to be on the bench as a top player like him. He prefers to start most games. So he doesn't want to put the manager in a position where he has to bench him and he saw the quality coming through. Who knows? But either way, this particular game is against Borussia Dortmund. Jude Bellingham was terrible. He was very ineffective going forward. He basically was doing most of his work going the other way. Um, he wasn't good at all. But again, he's turning into that top player already. And he's only 21 years old where he doesn't have a good game, but he has good moments, decisive moments, almost clutch moments where, you know, that's a chance at 1-0 where if he misplaces the ball, if he passes, if he's at Scott McTominay and he can't pass the ball five, you know, 10 yards across the pitch to his teammate in the, in the within his path, if it goes too far behind, if it goes too far in front, that chance is gone. Who knows? I might get Bruce Dortmund momentum. They might then go on to score a goal and then this fucking 1-1 and then suddenly the whole makeup of the game changes. Who knows? So that's a very important goal, actually, in the makeup of the in the overall running of the game. But um, I was just surprised to see how much people were concentrating on him and making it seem as if like he's the one that scored the winning goal or whatever. It's like, bro, he didn't even play that well, to be completely honest. But regardless, Real Madrid win another title, another Champions League one for Real Madrid. Um, I think for some of the players in that team, they've got six Champions League trophies in their time at Real Madrid. I think Tony Cruz and um, what's his face? And um, Luka Modric and Nacho and Carvajal. And I forgot who else have already six Champions League trophies under their belt. Six just them being at Real Madrid. Um, then you saw everything about the club. I think, you know, Jose Mourinho was gushing about Real Madrid um, in the post-match interview. Sorry, in the post-match um, coverage on TNT Sports. He was brilliant, by the way. It was so refreshing to hear Jose Mourinho talk as opposed to like Rio Ferdinand and fucking Steve McManaman and shit. Like, fuck with that shit. Um, hearing, hearing um, Jose Mourinho talk so well about the club. Hearing Mourinho talk so well about Ancelotti and say Ancelotti is not a social media manager. He's a proper, proper manager. You, you, you know, you go... You, Talk to his players about how he man how he coaches. Look at his trophy room. Look at the trophies, and he even started gushing about Real Madrid's structure as a as a football team. He said the structure is impeccable. It's very simplistic. I think he basically said it's like the Florentino Perez, whoever the person is underneath him, and then another person. It's basically three people, and they all answer to each other. So it's a kind of a chain, and that's basically it. No other thing else. Nothing else fancy. And I think whoever was with him asked, "Oh, why do all the other clubs do the fancy way?" And he basically said it's just because it's trendy just because it's trendy so even he can recognize that top clubs like that this is what you know this is what they're doing all the other clubs are doing all these convoluted things and they're kind of getting away from the genesis of the thing which is kind of great recruitment you know great structure um you know a winning mentality good culture because that's how you feel about Real Madrid actually around the club which is weird because you always felt Barcelona had that sort of like homely family very you know localized feeling Real Madrid is like one of the biggest clubs in the world family oriented vibe about them i don't know how they've cultivated that you see the players the players kids the wives the backroom staff like everybody's like in in sync 
there's a synergy there amongst all of them. It's fucking incredible. It really is. Um, I think Chiumani on the pitch said something like, oh, I think to um, Bellingham, like, oh, yeah, we won our first one. We've got, like, five more to win. Like, these guys are freaks, man. They built another way. Like, they've already just won one. They're already thinking about the other five they have to win going forward. Um, Mbappe's been confirmed, I think, via, um, what's his face, um, football journalist. And um, we're going to hear about the Mbappe confirmation, hopefully, I think, next week. And that's already crazy as well, considering they just won legitimately, you know, um, another fucking Champions League title. But again, I feel so sorry for Bruce Dortmund. Um, Sancho, not the greatest as well. He was very ineffective, didn't really do much. Loads of memes about him on the timeline, which is fair because if he would have played well, if Sancho would have balled out, if he would have dunked on Madrid, scored a hat trick, hat trick of scored a hat trick of goals, hat trick of assist, the timeline would have exploded with anti Ericsson Hog memes. So the fact that he failed and didn't play well the entire game, I think it's fair to also kind of chastise him and say, you know what, when your team needed you, you didn't come up clutch. So I kind of is what it is, but very, very, very enjoyable game, regardless. A very 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 enjoyable game and um, kind of hard to see a team of that level winning another trophy especially when you consider like united should be at this level too this is where man united should be at um our hierarchy should be looking at real madrid and what they've been able to achieve um how they keep changing their squad the makeup of it how they keep you know how they keep this winning mentality that then allows them to make more money and line the coffers of the board members and investors and all this malarkey because that's what it does winning these titles winning in the way that they do with the players that they have um it does allow you to then go on to just start making more money so if the glazers did only care about money guess what helps you make more money winning things so you'd hope the glazers ineos whoever would come through and say you know what we see what these guys are doing we want to copy this model and return united back to winning ways and not just be like a commercial entity because winning ways is always the best way to kind of go about it especially at this type of level um that's what your your supporters want to see great games um the ability to win the biggest trophies and just you know put on a bit of a spectacle for the fans man absolutely incredible big up real madrid absolutely big up real madrid impossible to hate impossible to hate so I've also been on this weird anti-social vibe, kind of anti-social, not anti-social. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I'm always fucking rabbiting and sharing my nonsense opinions on there, uninvited with no fucking encouragement whatsoever. But when it comes to other, any other social media platform, especially Instagram, I've kind of been off of it. I've decided to kind of, you know, spend most of my time on Twitter and not really on social and not really on that side of social media. And I think I've come away from it with some insights and some learnings. But I saw this clip courtesy of the wave check over there on Twitter um, that features Yo Gotti and the caption says Yo Gotti gives the key to survival so I'm going to play that for you and then give you my thoughts on why I think you know not being on Instagram as much as I was or as much as I used to be has been a net benefit to me going forward a lot of people survive longer just staying out of people business mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. like just man just I don't hear nothing I don't see nothing I don't know nothing mm -hmm. I ain't even got no opinion on nothing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's gotta be there. Just out, of, just out of the loop. And I have to agree. I think being out of the loop has been one of the best things ever. I've always been very... I've always been very against the idea about knowing everything about your friends anyway, personally. I feel like social media just, it does that. It's, that's the whole basis of it. It's to share your feelings, share your life, whatever it may be, your hobbies, your interests on there. But I've also have seen people go overboard and share absolutely every part of themselves on social. And I, and I think sometimes that takes away from the beauty of conversations, from the beauty of real interactions and all this malarkey. So I'd much rather learn about my IRL friends, people that I've cultivated relationship with, fostered relationship with, have a deep love and a appreciation for IRL I don't want to learn about a monumental thing in their life through flipping the social media feed I'd rather not especially when I'm getting tons of it at the same time it's just too much to handle already I'm already caring about people online that I shouldn't care about or that I don't know through my other podcasts I do the random show and even through stuff I do here on the Agassino Zinger show I don't. I already. I don't. I think I have like a limited amount of RAM in terms of information, personal information about people, and I have to just try to prioritize what is beneficial and what isn't. And I think taking the approach of like, okay, cool. I don't, I'm not going to be on social. I'm not going to be on Instagram much as I was in the past because I don't want to see every fucking life up there of my friends. But then I'm also going to go out of my way that if my friends invite me for a brunch or something, I'm not going to try and flake and I'm actually going to go and attend something I still need to kind of get over because I'm really crap at that. But then 
I'm going to, you know, I'm going to also understand that sometimes I'm going to miss things and I'm going to be left out of things. And that's not a slight on me or anything. It's just because I'm outside of our mind because I'm not uploading. No one's going to be checking for me anyway. Number one, because I'm not really a priority. I don't think in most people's lives. But secondly, because I'm not uploading much, I'm not, I'm also not front of your mind. So if I'm not front of your mind, I'm out of your mind. And if I'm out of your mind, I basically don't exist. So if that's the case, then taking a step back isn't a bad thing. And I've noticed actually, because of the amount of output I've been doing, especially in terms of content, I've noticed that I've been able to be more consistent with my content without that destruction. Honestly, because it was already getting bad anyway, because I was locked into seeing other people's shit and I was into my own shit and I was doing other shit outside and whatever. So many distractions that was taking me away from actually doing the things that I enjoy to do, which is obviously recording content like this and doing podcasts, doing live streams, making videos, writing, DJing, all this stuff is stuff that I love and enjoy. And I'll obviously want to do full time as a career, but it's hard to do all that when you've got all this shit on your mind. So sometimes clearing that stuff and actually focusing on the thing that you want to do is actually the best way to go about it going forward. But in general, anyway, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a big, thing but i think it isn't uh it is flipping ideal timing because the feed on instagram anyway is a bit shit now um they prioritize a lot of like paid content because i've because i remember there was a time in maybe it was maybe a couple of years ago maybe more than that where i started to notice a trend on my especially on my social media feed where i was getting recommended um advertised post from random people like not even like brands like individuals who are basically boosting their fit pics like i'm not like, i'm not kidding this is like maybe four or five years ago i remember thinking about it. this is so ridiculous i remember taking screenshots of them sending them to friends and laughing at these people oh my god what a loser how are you gonna boost your fit pic and now this has become the norm because the instagram algorithm has been so fucked up now that people's organic posts on their actual feed don't get anywhere so if you actually want to you know you want your friends to see your fit you want to get your fit off you just want to increase your ability to get more engagement you fucking chuck 10 10 pounds 20 pounds behind that bad boy and it will actually help so that's become a thing that i've seen more often now going forward i've been like wow you know what I'm not I'm not mad at it now because now I understand because the organic feed doesn't work as well so people have to do a lot more to push content that you would have seen beforehand um into your face and again for me you know I'd much rather just find out about my friends at IRL it's a bit of a weird stance to take but I think again considering I don't really have many like close 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 friends anyway it doesn't really you know doesn't matter really for the most part whoever i do want to hear from i can just pick up the phone call i can just pick up my phone sorry and call them and i'm sure they'll be happy to hear from from me and i'll be happy to hear their voice but when it comes to finding out about random people legitimately people that i hung out with like five ten years ago you know i'd rather learn about you in real life i don't want to learn about you via the social media it's already bad enough that i don't see you enough i know and i don't want to learn about your big life events through social media it just feels so detached from reality but i feel like output wise productivity wise has been a net positive it really has been a net positive to kind of be that guy that just you know stays away from all this stuff online and just is able to kind of chill without all those added distractions i really really do i really really do moving on from that we've got this really interesting article which is weird because i've been actually considering this year going it might be a bit late to be honest because festival season feels like it's already kicking off and you know people have already, already saved up money they already bought tickets so i'm definitely going to go to dre merlin festival again this year or well, not again definitely this year because i meant to go last year i didn't go but i'm just going to appear there so it can't be a big thing i'm going to make videos about it. i'm just going to appear and do you know vlogs about it when i obviously arrive there but another one i was going to do in between was melt I've always wanted to go to Mel. It's one of it's basically, you know, another one of those kind of big festivals within the summer months in terms of dance music that people try and go, try and go into. Um, I think the Stone f Music Festival, the Stone one, wherever that was in somewhere else in Germany, that has maybe a bit more of a like Bergheiny sort of aesthetic and feel behind it. The programming, of, but I like the programming on Mel. I'm not gonna lie, like. I, I, <sighs> some people do prefer like festivals when they're a little bit more specific in terms of their genres like in terms of their subcultures in terms of their sub genres that they kind of specify in but i purposely prefer dance music festivals that cover a bit more of a broad range of djs i just i just don't want the same old people you know and i feel like stone 
a music that that stone festival one that happens as well that's a little bit too much like you know black latex double sole shoes bergheim s type of vibe a lot of the people that you'd see if you'd go to rso if you'd go to bergheim if you'd go to you know whatever venue it is other than amsterdam if you'd go to e1 fold venue mot you see the same people play so i prefer to see a little bit more of a range and i think melt does a good job of like appealing to the overground appealing to the underground and everything else in between well unfortunately unfortunately this this year courtesy of ra this year's melt festival 2024 will be the final one so i actually do need to go even if i end up going for like a day because i don't think it's that far out of berlin i think you can just fly to berlin and take a train to wherever this festival is so i might just go for the day and then just come back the next day not too bad um but obviously it's a festival you kind of want to camp and do the whole experience but whatever i'll just figure it out it's kind of wild isn't it this is actually the last year of it man fucking crazy um let's actually see why they said that courtesy of ra says melt won't return next year the long-standing saxony anhalt event broke the news today may 30 of citing instrumental changes in the festival lineup as a reason for its decision launched in 1997 melt is one of the biggest open air electronic music festivals in germany it takes place in ferropolis an open air industrial museum near the town of grafen grafen hein chin um if you, i'm sure most of you guys know the venue it's the same place where hole happens um it's that iconic venue where they have the massive crane and shit it looks fucking incredible i think there's also a pond near there's all that people dunking and swim at the final edition of melt will take place on july the 11th to the 13th um let me actually check out the actual lineup for it and then we're actually going to check the casual statement from melt and see exactly why they decided to end this festival because this is quite heartbreaking news and a bit of a surprise for me because i really wanted to go um to future ones but i guess this year is actually the last one i could actually attend if i do decide to attend so this is courtesy of melt instagram account it says as follows dear melt family after 27 unforgettable years we must announce that with heavy hearts that this year will be our final melt festival due to various factors we can no longer continue the festival fucking crazy isn't it like look at the things that have been taken away from us post covid covid legitimately will go down as one of the worst times ever obviously for humanity bunch of people died r.i.p to those people that passed away um you know people went people are still suffering from long covid and all other you know crazy fatal near fatal fucking things as a consequence of covid but culturally for the arts covid was one of the worst things ever worst things ever some people have never recovered some institutions some brands some festivals collectives have kind of disbanded people's careers got upended people got displaced you know it's been absolutely crazy how much bad how negatively it's affected culture especially my little niche which is dance music fuck man um and obviously the, you know because i say covid as as like the precursor to everything else that happened obviously i'm sure i know you know recessions and financial squeeze and wars around the world also don't help but i'm sure the covid was a was one of those big domino effects it continues if someone had told us back in 1977 our very first festival that melt would still exist in 2024 we would have thought that they were crazy in 1999 we found our home in ferropolis where we danced celebrated and created unforgettable moments for 25 years i wonder where the actual first first one took place so i guess they had three or two like two sorry 97 99 98 and then they had a 999 one of fair pullets i wonder where the first one took place our goal has always been to create special unique experiences and a space where one could be free loose will lose oneself in the music and the night thanks to you this vision became a reality next slide the memories of the incomparable charm of ferropolis and timeless legendary sleepless floor the sea lights of the um, auto scooter the magical sunrises and the many legendary performances and experiences will forever remain in our hearts we want to thank each and every one of you for your passion your loyalty and incredible memories anyone who wants to dance throughout the night with us one last time experience the unforgettable vibe and feel the mystique of melt is warmly invited to melt 2024 and of course we have a surprise in store that we can't wait to announce with deepest gratitude and love your melt team absolutely tragic and a really fucking tragic that they fucking ending um look at all the condolences and tributes from all the big djs in the flipping comments as well you've got ellen allian here saying missing you already breaks my heart melt sleepless floor stay in our souls really don't know what to say beautiful music sunrises smiles and long journey keep it alive but there's i guess there's another one as well that i want to go to in berlin i think it's called the nation of godwana um what you call it my friend's been telling me to go there for years she has um so big up her you know who you are 
um, I'll probably need to check that out probably again next year. Probably a bit too late to check out now. Last time I checked, I think festival tickets already sold out. But I'm definitely going to be trying. I've already got Junction Two Festival I'm going to this year, and then I've got obviously I'm trying to go to Melt later on, which is obviously next month, and then of course um, Dre Molin I think in September. So those are free. I can already hit this month, which is good. This year, sorry, which is good compared to last year, which I did absolutely zero. And again, they're all coming up very quickly. I've got you know, still I need to go to Open Ground. So many things I have to go to, but fucking hell, man, it's sad that Melt is only is ending this year really really is um jasmine omera says i played there in 2008 zoot woman the crowd in the location was spectacular to this day it's still my favorite gig ever thank you for your wonderful memories another person here says sleepless floor forever I need to check that out when i go there um let's see this one this this is in german let's see the translation what they say here uh broke the melt yourself existing thanks for that it's far away original festival melt without sleepers is like a human without a heart still have one last year where you can pull the last money out of your good piece um i can't there's too much here oh my god melt was one of my first edge. fka m4a says oh my god Melt was one of the first electronic festivals I ever attended and it was birthed the idea of moving both to Berlin and becoming a selector. So thank you. Honored to share this final edition with you and play for the second time. Let's make let's make it massive. Oh, I'm I'm eager to see him actually. Let me heart that. I, I like that guy. He's really good. Um who else is saying here? Jamie X has changed my life in 2015. Um Elia Kula, what she's saying. Melt was one of the first big festivals I've attended. Yeah, look, everyone's saying the same thing. Everyone that's played or that is playing is saying that melt was one of the big festivals they attended i guess because it's a german festival near berlin the lineups are quite varied and broad um similar type of vibes and stuff you'd see if you'd go out on a night on a weekend in berlin or in any dance music major festival so it's quite cool to see all these prominent people in the scene now say that melt was the starting block for me anyway music wise i think you know to i don't know it's not really a festival it's more just going out i was kind of spoiled in london but you know primavera obviously is a big one but you don't really go primavera to listen to dj you go for the bands really but it's quite cool to see i guess in europe it's different because dance music in europe is way more popular in the mainstream as opposed to maybe in the uk i think people in the uk tend to go to festivals for bands for the most part and again i could be const- i could be mistaken but that's what i think anyway continuing on elia kula elia kula says metal is one of the first big festivals i've attended sleeping in in a one ma- in one human tent with a couple of friends hung over at the sleepless floor listening to caribou play live on that massive stage all the memories what later watching many of my friends play you're gonna be missed um, Joe, so whoever that person is, the end of an era, much love. And um, those of minorities said 20, 2009, Oasis at Melt. Oasis played at Melt Festival in 2009. I didn't know that. Oasis to Melt Festival. Wow, bro. How tragic this festival is dying and they've had people like Oasis playing. This is, this is a tragedy. I wonder why exactly why this is happening. Yeah, there we go. We've got remastered audio. Of them playing at Melt 2009. We've got a picture here of them playing 2009. That's fucking wild. Big up Melt Festival, man. What an absolute tragedy that that festival's ending. I really do wonder why it's actually ending. Did they mention it? I'm not sure if they mentioned it in the actual post itself. But anyway, we'll check it out later. Let's see what they say in the comments down below. Fuck, man. Uh, what else people saying here? Um, another one says, well, you kicked off Melt when you closed the Sleepless. You killed... Oh, really? Everyone's complaining that they killed me because Sleepless Floor's gone. What is a Sleepless Floor? What the hell is that? What is this that everyone keeps talking about? So it's a stage, right? I'm assuming it's a stage. There we go. 2017. Tales from Melt Sleepless Floor. Let's see what this is about. Because I'm curious to see why everybody's so butthurt and annoyed that this Sleepless Floor thing is no longer there anymore. Okay. Courtesy of Crack Magazine. Tales from Sleepless Floor. Since its inception in 2004, Melt Festival Sleepless Floor has passed into rave law. Many festivals will lay claim to capturing the freedom and subversion of the in, the in sorry engendered in early dance music culture, but few have come quite close as Melt Sleepless Floor, a 24-hour stage that runs the duration of the festival. Wow! There's a 24-hour stage they had on there. I wonder why they ended it. Just logistics or something. A 24-hour stage that runs the duration of the festival. So Melt used to be one day, I'm guessing a full 90 hours it's unique anything goes environment is one of the last bastions of club music's founding principles togetherness it's not just a stamina entrenched party goers um, who prize the open-ended approach to have programming 
um, sorry, it's not just stamina in, enriched party goers who prize the open ended approach to rave programming, but also DJs, many becoming de facto residents who return year after year to play marathon sets unfettered by the usual constraints placed on festival sets. After all, towards the end of those long 90 hours when the entire festival congregates on the floor for the final blowout, you never know quite what's going to go down. Imagine how loopy and how almost, you know, hallucinogenic that must feel when you're in the fucking sun like you know in the summer in berlin or in the summer in germany overall any place outside of the uk it's actually really really hot and to the pictures and videos that i've seen and for the times that i've been to berlin especially in the summer it's fucking baking so could you imagine you're on whatever pill you're on you're fucking loopy as it is you're drinking warm beers it's hitting your fucking head you're going fucking crazy the lights are shining there's all these smoke in the air something's burning in your head and the thing is going on for 90 hours oh that must be so much fun i wish i could have been there I had no idea it's a thing. To celebrate the stage's iconic status, we're presenting some of the most exclusive shots from Melt's archive that captured the unique atmosphere. We also ranked, we also asked DJ, sorry, who experienced playing there to share their secrets and divulge what it is that makes Sleepless Floor so special. We got stories of Mr. Ride and Sleepless Selectors and the enduring power of love and unity. Man, I wish I could do something like this, man. Have like a Sleepless Floor arena or area somewhere. That'd be so fucking cool. Don't you think? Look at that. Um who's this someone called uh curious natural naturale we played the sleepless floor in 2009 when there would be um, where there would have been two sleepless floor the open air floor and an indoor floor with an old industrial hangar yo melt is a forward think to be fair it's not surprising a place like melt had to kind of end in it things like this that are really f forward thinking that are really pushing the envelope almost doing things for the heads not doing things for profit have to end they never really last too long which is really annoying right the ones that really try and do interesting cool things they really find it hard to last um you know hopefully this is a, this is a temporary pause because it sounds incredible um so we play sleepless floor in 2009 when there would have been two sleepless floor an open air and an industrial one then our good friend um m pro curated the flower the floor to corp no, then our good friend Empro curated the floor in cooperation with the bookers at Melt. Our set started right after the huge thunderstorm and normally the floor would be open at this time but the speakers had been used to avoid danger. Um, some minutes after the first sounds people came from the festival site dressed up in garbage bags and started dancing. This will stay in our heads forever. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine playing in the festival and people have legitimately popped holes in garbage bags and covered themselves in it like a poncho. Can you imagine how fucking that's a sight to behold? honestly sleepless floor can't be compared to any other part of the festival it's something that the black sheep or the chaotic little sister maybe they might bring sleepless floor back for this one maybe that's one of the big surprises maybe the big surprise for this year the end the last one is that they bring sleepless floor back i might have to go um sleepless floor stands for itself and it's like the individual festival within the festival always always on always loud and just sleepless when the rest of the festival is taking a nap it's really a mix expanding um how would you describe the atmosphere for someone who's never been it's really mind expanding you completely forget about time space and anything else around you where are there any more moments in particular that stand out yes i think after nearly 10 years we finally can reveal the secret in 2009 we drank liquor worth more than 10 000 euro so it really went out of control excuse me did they pay for that or did they just drink it and just steal it this is probably the reason why they're going out of business people were fucking drinking ten thousand euros worth of stock oh man fucking hell melt do you have any other stories or any anecdotes from sleepless floor since 2009 we played the closing set every year maybe only ellen alien has played sleepless floor more often so we really could fill a whole book of anecdotes that should be a good one and a, a book from melt of all the fucking stories and pictures over the years that would be fucking cool we've been around since that might be a good thing for a fundraiser if they need more money to kind of keep the lights on maybe that might be a good idea for a fundraiser like a book like a coffee table book or something we've been around sleepers for the whole time in the same some point on monday morning um daniel stefanik asked me asked for the next dj and the dj was there we can't tell you their name right now but before they could start playing he fell asleep right on the stage so the last dj in the relatively acceptable condition they allowed us to play the set until the dj woke up after 12 hours we stopped the music and he woke up sleepless oh brilliant i love that story rod had when did you play sleepers for i've known melt festival for many years but never played 
played the legendary she performed by myself playing there the first time was a great as you had experience intimate never ending going rave what makes people feel special as i said the special thing about floyd is the atmosphere um okay rod had doesn't much have to say here matthias caden legend very first time i played sleepers for 2002 they've had look at the people they have had play rod had matthias caden like they've, had, they've really put on some people in it um the very first time i played at sleepless floor was 2012 compared to the festival itself um with its big stages and huge lineup the sleepless floor is very small and has a somewhat intimate atmosphere it's purely focused on music so they've almost got like a underground clubby vibe going on on a very bait and commercial festival you can't compare in it this kind of programming is what makes these festivals so fucking special what makes people feel so special do you think i believe it's the intimate atmosphere i mentioned it before but maybe also the beach vibes the crowd is dancing on sand all that and the small stage and the small decoration special decoration sorry create a wonderful atmosphere i have a feeling that some people only come melt on sunday so that they can dance on the sleepless floor the acts the music and the floor are very um Het heterogeneous a mix of many styles which is exciting yeah that might be something i might have to do i might have to just flying for the sunday and just feel fucking crazy how would you describe the atmosphere of someone who's never been the sleepless floor is a special place to lose to get lost in time i lost myself a few times the lineup is always great are there any moments in particular that stand out each time that i played there was special the crowds always so much power um, do you have any other stories in 20 2014 i missed my ride back home it was amazing i ended up staying until monday afternoon Tijana T, she's always she's she's actually she's actually a good story to let's see what she has to say. Um I first played there last year, which was 2016, I'm guessing. Um I was so impressed. I had such a beautiful time, I almost cried when it was over. I love the festival spirit and it's getting together feeling and it felt it really strong here. You see how people were so different, their attitudes towards fucking festivals back then, back in these type of eras. I wonder why people nowadays have such a there's such a taboo around festivals. I wonder if it's because of the prol proliferation of like club nights is it because they've been told that festivals are lame or is it because they don't like the crowd at festivals because festivals for the most part are going to be full of normies you'd imagine because they're the ones that like to have like you know certain seasons or certain times of the year when they go raving so maybe they work all winter or spring to go and party in the summer and maybe all of those people kind of put off some of the heads who think they're kind of underground and cool but I've always thought festivals, especially dance music festivals, they're like a special way to enjoy dance music because they're very different to clubs. I've never really liked festivals that try and program it to be a nightclub. It's not. A festival experience should be a festival experience. So I, I'm always a believer festival programming should really have a much more um, diverse booking policy than a normal club night. You shouldn't be going for the bait names. You should be going for like a more, you know, varied in terms of ages, backgrounds, genres that they play. That's what can really make a break a, a festival, in my opinion, especially dance music centered. Having it just be like the same lineups you see when you go to Fabric, Fold, Divinity, MOT, it's just boring, man. It really is. Um, I really like the mix up and the change and maybe the surprises in festivals, and especially European ones. Like some of the best ones are when you go and you don't know who's playing. Like I still to this day, I can't remember his name, but the guy that plays at the end of Primavera Sound is like a legend. I don't even remember his name, but if you go to Primavera Sound Festival, you know like there's a guy that plays at the end of Primavera Sound Festival on the last day on the main stage, and he fucking destroys. And it's almost like he's almost like an indie dance type of level DJ, right? Playing loads of like pop edits and trance, no, sorry, indie trance edits and stuff like that. And he absolutely kills it every fucking year. And he's just like a local hero, I think, for the most part, or someone that's just associated with Primavera Sound, really. So I never really understand the fucking taboo or the fucking, you know, people that look, the pretentiousness around festivals. It's like, if you like clubs, you like clubs. If you like festivals, you like festivals. But one and the other don't negate the other. Like, they're both important parts of dance music nightlife and just this thing that we call the scene and um, one without the other doesn't work to be honest but again what do i know anyway tijana t what makes it special the sleepless floor the best part of sleepless floor is that it doesn't appear pretentious everything is in the right size at the same right amount the stage is not too big the programming is very much on point which is quite important for a party that goes on continuously whoever's playing there be it a big name or an emerging artist is treated the same and there's no hierarchy amongst the djs everyone is equally important well not important this makes it like an ego-free zone not um which is always reflecting nicely on the party it's a place where djs are not beyond the dancers and the crowds and it's rare these days especially exactly if anything festivals should be a moment where you know maybe in clubs you can't be that hands-on but if you're a dj a little, be, being a little bit on the ground and kind of connecting to your fucking fans and being amongst your peers and 
being around your it's almost like I, I think festival should be seen as like you know like fashion week a lot of people that go to fashion week kind of like it just because of the vibes because you get to meet all your friends in the industry you get to go to showrooms you get to meet buyers bump into old like staff members at particular brands and people in the scene that hot part of it is important as well in part of the whole industry and keeps everything moving and i think the same thing should happen to festivals also especially it's like um ibifa season right that's when all the fucking heads go to fucking ibifa and anger so it continues how do you describe the atmosphere for someone who's never been actually last year i met people who come from who came, who come to melt festival just for the sleepless floor and that says a lot about it it's a club party within the festival a bit more intimate and a bit more warm and loving what i felt that at that stage is genuine rave spirit from the 90s when techno culture was still considered a continuation of hippie culture true you don't get that much anymore do you that's a very good point she makes there what i felt what i felt at that stage is the genuine rave spirit from the 90s when techno culture was still considered a continuation of hippie culture that's probably what you want in an ideal festival if you were going to sell a festival and have a one line to kind of describe why your festival is better or different from the others would be this it's a continuation of the 90s spirit of hippie culture that kind of influenced techno you know what I mean? That's what you just kind of say. Um, I don't want to sound prophetic, but it's all about love and unity. Whoever is on a dance floor is part of the tribe, and we're all in the moment together equally. This vibe is almost disappearing from parties and festivals these days, and it's nice to see that there's still places which manage to nurture this approach. Are there any moments in particular that stand out for you playing on Sleepless Floor? For me, playing was a pure pleasure. As a festival goer, I wouldn't miss Ellen Ellen's traditional closing marathon. Do you have any other stories or anecdotes from Sleepless Floor? It seems like playing there is one of the most important gigs of last year or the one that most mattered most. I still have people coming to me at parties all around the world and giving me little pieces of paper where they say they first saw me at Melt and now they're following what I do. I first saw you at Melt and now I've traveled Hong Kong to Korea to see you again. Crazy. <sighs> Absolutely crazy. So anyway, let's go back to the um, let's go back to the actual thing, the lineup, because I want to see who's actually playing there, because I really want to go this year. Um, who do we have here? We have so many people. We have Bambi, big up Bambi, Bashka, uh, Bonobo playing. We got Byron Gates, but sorry, Byron Yeats are a big fan. Chasing Status, Legends, uh, D Tiffany, who definitely want to go see DJ Heartstring, DJ Coz, uh, DJ Python, Helen the Health back to back, and Mel G will be fucking sick. You got Eris Jew, who I'm a big fan of. Eris Drew, I'm a big fan of um you got evian evian versus back back of ferrari ferrari riot ferrari rot ferrari riot ferrari rot fatty mohem fk m4a freddie k's playing that should be a fucking barnstormer funk assault um who else got your honey dijon oh i have to go james blake J jada g job jose yo they went hard this year isn't it Kenya Grace is playing, who I just saw via a festival. I think it's called We Love Green in in France. I didn't know much about her, but she sounds incredible. I don't know if it's like what is it, break beats, drum and bass, trance inspired stuff. She sings on the mic, plays on the fucking decks. I'm, I I want to see her perform. She looked really fucking cool. Um, who have we got here? We got that guy Marlon Hofstad, who got all those views on Boiler Room for that stuff that I don't really like. I think it was trancey. I didn't really like it. We've got a weird back to back here. Marcel Deepman back to back with VTSS. Bizarre, but I'm maybe for it. Maron's playing. Big up Maron. Okay, Williams, Overmono. That'll be fucking sick to go check out. Wow, this lineup is fucking crazy. Sanfa's playing. Romy, I'm guessing from XX. Is that Romy from XX or somebody else? Skepta's playing. Um, you got Cita's playing as well. That should be a good one. Cita will be an actual good one. Um, if this is the same Cita that I think of, who is in actual relationship with somebody from the Skepta crew. Um, so if this is like reggaeton inspired shit, this should be fucking good. Reggaeton, Latin Trap, that should be good. I, I don't know if she if that's what she plays, but judgment what she looks like and her background, that is what I'm assuming. And if it is massive, you got Slater playing, Soft Crush. Wow, Sugar Babes is in the the band. <laughs> what? Holy shit. That should be fucking great, isn't it? Yeah, this looks like a good festival to kind of go to. So, so far, tickets are still available, I'm assuming, right? Um, I can't really see them where you can purchase them on here. It doesn't say, okay, tickets, I think you have to, you have to go on the actual website to go purchase them. I, I thought you could purchase them through RA, I, I guess not. And I guess tickets are like, what, £100? What's it? €200 Euros maybe for the full weekend? Weekend pass, 209 Not bad, you know? If you, When you think about it, 209 is basically three days for a weekend pass not bad 
um, two or five, two or two ten euros. You got a premium weekend ticket pass. What's a premium get you? Premium is two sixty. Um, I wonder. Let's see what a premium gets you. Let's put that into English. I want to see what what what. While going for the premium, what does a premium get you? I'm curious to see how much what you get for the premium ticket. So a premium is two sixty euros. Uh, premium ticket formerly weekend plus includes three days of festival and camping from the first day okay so does that that weekend include camping as well or not includes yeah okay in case camping as well what do you get for this the garbage deposit of 10 euros is already included premium includes premium shuttle from the campsite to the festival ground premium campsite um santi flat for premium showers and toilets okay cool so you get you get nice showers and toilets and you also get a breakfast no, if you arrive, okay, cool. That's pretty decent, though, isn't it? Breakfast is important. It's the most important meal of the day to load up on. You get a nice camping ground, and you get a fucking shower as well. A nice shower, by the way. I'm assuming the other ones aren't that great. Um, and then two day pass for the Friday and Saturday is one sixty euros. That's actually pretty decent. I'm not gonna lie. That's actually a good price for a festival. Um, and again, the volume is gonna be so fucking loud. The volume is gonna be fucking ear splitting. Again, for someone from London who's used to fucking shit parties with low volume it's going to be such a pleasure so thursday what do we have here bashka playing I'll, I'll be cool to see her play um chasing status i'll be get, glad to see them play byron yeats to eris drew uh who else do i want to see here i would actually like to see horse girl i've never actually seen horse girl perform i've seen horse girl performances on youtube obviously but i won't actually seen horse girl perform irl um also jada g over mono sam on thursday too romy from excess yes that's her um who else we got here we got sega bodega who did a great remix recently on that fucking um khalil fucking album uh oh wow you got the you got a uh, mary uh america's takeover as well that should be pretty good super gloss la noche <sighs> yeah it's a fucking good it's, it's a good fucking festival man let's not lie it's a fucking good fucking festival. I have to fucking check this out. I'm not going to lie. I have to check this fucking out. Um, let's continue some of the tributes and I'm obviously going to move on to the next topic. Digitalism says, so the person here says, well, you killed off Melt when you closed the Sleepless. I had my best festival experience at, but uh, nowadays it's more about the money than the rave scene. Better off without the version of Melt. Oh, Jesus Christ, Fili um, Felipe, man. Muy, muy negativo. Um, Chijana T says, thank you for having me a few years in a row. I cherish a lot of special moments at Melt. It was always one of my favorite festivals to play. This is truly sad news. Um, DJ Spit says, forever in my heart. Um, another person says, very sad, but countless magic moments in the 25 years. Thanks for the for the crew for starting this journey. Thanks for giving me their office when I moved to Berlin. And yeah, loads of just nice tributes. Electronic Beats, one of the great websites out there back in the day, a place where I learned a lot about the scene, actually. Big up Electronic Beats. Um, they said this one will be extra special. Um, hands down, the best festival ever. Yeah, loads of great fucking memories from loads of people here pouring out their hearts and giving these people a massive, massive tribute. Job Jose did a heart. DJ Heartstrings also hearts. Loads of fucking hearts here. So, oh no everyone's fucking heartbroken and taken aback by this news so a bit oh look at that that's a good great name for an instagram but isn't it prosego princess i love that <laughs> um but yeah i'm i'm really gonna go i can't wait love foxy here to end it i love foxy says honor to play the next honest to play the last one with you angels always been always been bomb lord cool big up love foxy and big up melt can't wait to go check this out when it does eventually happen which is going to be happening obviously in june and july or sorry in july actually july the 11th to the 13th i think that's when the actual date of the festival is going to be happening so i'm really eager to fucking check that out so big up melt big up fucking melt and it's really sad to hear that they're having to end it's really sad to hear they have to end We've got this pretty mad news of course here courtesy of variety regarding the one and only jennifer lopez jennifer lopez unfortunately jennifer Lopez unfortunately has had to cancel her entire summer tour. Jennifer Lopez's entire summer tour has been cancelled. And um it's to no surprise to anybody out there, especially some of you who've listened to her album. I actually had the mispleasure or the displeasure or the unfortunate um circumstances of having to listen to her album because I'm a fucking music addict. I listen to absolutely everything. And I was taken aback by how terrible and how garbage and almost you know actually surprised me by her latest album. It's almost how dated and old she sounded, which is really odd. You don't really usually have that feeling Listen to somebody, but she sounded so old, dated, and just tired. And it immediately, immediately made me think, like, Jennifer Lopez doesn't need a music career. Surely music has to be the least 
profitable thing from her arsenal or her various revenue streams so why do it do you know what i mean it's probably the hardest thing to do of the of the of, of all the things she does i'd imagine music is the hardest and it also doesn't really give her the most money right she gets probably the least amount of splits from music but she's still how you're making it but the difference between early you know late 90s to early 2000s jennifer lopez and now is just very very stark she's not really at the level that she needs to be to kind of compete with these young girls she's not even at the level that she used to be to compete with her fucking self and it just really is terrible so it's no surprise to see that the summer tour is also cancelled because i don't think a lot of people listen to the album number one and the ones that did listen to it are probably not that excited or eager to go and see a performing live to be completely honest um so this article quotes a variety says jennifer lopez has cancelled this is me live summer tour to spend more time with her family and is heart sick over the decision the singer announced to fans a newsletter on friday imagine lying that you had to cancel your tour to spend time with your family jennifer lopez probably doesn't spend any time with her family outside the time that she needs to spend with her family because when she's not with her family she's in a gym when she's not in a gym she's on a red carpet if she's not on a red carpet she's on doing some show some tv thing there is no time to spend with your family and friends she probably barely has time to spend time with fucking ben affleck and now you're trying to tell me she wants to spend time with her family instead of touring the world dancing in front of adoring fans and getting flown all over places private and eating at nice restaurants and drinking all this come on man let's be real let's be real i wish people would i wish some people would just be honest and say hey it didn't work out I, I know you can't say it but i wish that was the case i wish you could just say hey um the ticket i didn't sell enough tickets i booked probably two, two bigger venues because now now jt doesn't look crazy right when jt made a decision to do all these like club gigs and bar gigs and kind of smaller venues to kind of do an old school a and r approach and kind of build herself up because you know jt from the city girls was known as jt from the city girls so she needed to actually carve her own identity she dropped a few records she done some great music videos attended some fashion shows but ultimately the one thing that she needed to do was to touch the people as herself solo artist but she was to do it in a real way what better way to do it if you're jt if you're this hood princess if you're kind of ghetto if you're kind of kind of ratchet go to where the your fans actually listen to your music don't pretend like your fans are in arenas no your fans fans are in cocktail bars they're in barbecue spots they're in lounge bars right they're in these like hood places and then from there you can build up and that's what she did and she killed it and the footage from it honestly i don't know if they knew this but jt's team have to be happy now because the footage from her performing at these places the b-roll that they have is mm, just amazing like the, the, all the phones in the air everyone screaming and rapping her lyrics her standing on top of tables with a million people like on top of on top, you know on stages with a million fucking goons behind her girls in the stage with their fans like oh, it's just amazing and that is a great way to kind of build it and you're hoping next year you can go on like a bit of a mini tour in like venues that might be like you know 2000 cap and then kind of push on from there but jennifer lopez probably just you know thought she was bigger than what she actually was booked a few arena places and quickly realized that in 2024 no one really cares about jennifer lopez like that um it continues representative for a tour promoter live nation announced today that jennifer lopez u.s summer tour this is me dot 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 live is cancelled citing jennifer lopez taking time away from her children family and close friends and it's not even like it's been postponed because usually in like record you know in the music industry you're not really allowed to retire which is why rihanna keeps getting asked about new albums which is why cardi b is basically being forced to put a new album out even though she doesn't clearly want to do it in in music you, you're not really allowed to say you retire i don't think so i don't think you're contractually contractually allowed to say it and i also don't think you're contractually allowed to say cancelled it's always postponed you know whatever that, that they don't really like to, to have finality with it but on this one they're saying no it's been cancelled for those who purchased through Ticketmaster, tickets will automatically be refunded. There's nothing further than fans need to do. For those who purchased through third party resale sites like SeatGeek and StubHub and Vivid Seats, etc., please reach out to your points purchase for more details. It continues. A special message from JLo. I'm completely heart sick <laughs> and devastated about the time letting you down. Please know that I wouldn't do this if it didn't feel like absolutely necessary. I promise I'll make it up to it and we'll be together again. I love you all so much. There is our next time. There is our next time. I think JLo basically realized with that new album that she just dropped or the recent album that she just dropped that you know it was probably a wake-up call i think every artist probably needs that but i think nowadays post covid there's been a lot more of it nowadays we've seen a lot more people a lot more big bands um basically canceling tours and stuff because they finally realized that oh shit the celebrity that they once had the pool that they had 
post pre COVID isn't the same pool that they now have. And just nowadays, people's tastes have changed. You have to do a lot to get people out of their houses. You really do, which is why I think nowadays, actually, if you are able to sell out places like what Nicki Minaj is doing with her fucking Pink Friday two tour, you have to be really, you know, heralded. If you can get people out, if you can get people to buy tickets, if you can get them to turn up, dressed up, going crazy, reciting your lyrics and shit. That require that that deserves a bit of praise because it's very difficult to get people to buy tickets ahead of time and to actually leave their house to kind of see you. So the fact that people do that means that you're a real big deal. Last bit here: the news does not come as a total surprise as to, as the tour has been beset with reports of poor ticket sales um many unsold seats on ticket websites maybe some of my more fashion forward um male friends out there or brothers and sisters are probably more prone to especially the ones that occupy the lgbtq scene and shit i feel like those guys gays and the queers probably are way better at wearing fashion clothes in summer or looking good in the summer as opposed to regular dudes i think regular dudes have a hard time doing it if you're not you're usually just wearing uh you know short versions of the trousers you already wear so it's like cargo shorts jean shorts um sweat shorts I mean, that's all it is it's just a, a short version of what you're wearing whereas i feel like the queers and the gays they actually have outfits that they wear that are different like maybe they have like linen pants like you know just something different like it's not just like you know just taking what trousers they have and cutting them in half so um i think stushi have done a really good job of presenting some alternative looks and alternative styles that probably could lend themselves to good summer outfits so this is stushi summer 2024 lookbook um courtesy of them on their main website the blurb says stushi's first delivery of 2024 offers a breath of new familiar styles designed for warmer temperatures seasonal pieces like lightweight plaid shirts and shorts can be found alongside sport jerseys loose knits characteristics of the brand's relaxed approach to dressing stushi's first summer drop will drop on first friday the 24th which is already out already so if you already listen to this most of the stuff should already be in your local stussy chapter as i speak so again stuff like this overshirt very nicely done with a nice zip on it um the pants that this girl's wearing on this first post look and look first page look amazing especially with the sandals this guy here oddly enough has very very thick legs compared to the upper body but still the shorts look really good on him i, I don't know maybe it's just me but i'm not a fan of shorts that go over the knees if I want to show my legs, I want to show my fucking legs and I want to show a bit of thigh muscle because I'm squatting loads these days. But I've never really liked these jaw length or these like f pedal pusher three quarter length size shorts. I always thought they looked horrendous, me personally. Maybe I'm in the wrong gear. Um, there's a really nice work jacket here on this level. This is really nice. Um, I also love the look of that shirt. The boots there with the yellow laces look fucking sublime. This vest top thing looks really cool. I love the cut on this Stussy hoodie with a script logo on the front beautiful um the shape of it is really good um i also love maybe the the dye effect i'm not sure if it's a dye effect or wash effect on the actual cotton itself it looks really nice this suit jack this suit looks really cool this model doesn't make him look cool because unfortunately again he's got very you know his bottom half is a bit whatever but the suit looks really nice it's almost like a crumpled effect in it i don't know what that is it's like a crinkled effect it's like a double breasted um, striped blazer it's almost got a crinkly effect on it and it also comes with a pair of matching shorts but i just don't like how long the shorts are if that was me i'd probably get the shorts tailored while to say this i'd probably get them tailored to sit a, a little bit above the knee it's just a bit too long for me there and i don't like how they look with that fit and on him as well he looks a little bit frumpy for them to be honest he looks really good here though this oh that's a fucking classic la fit with those sunglasses oh look at that leather top oh my god look at that leather top it's almost got this weird hot it's got like a perforation so imagine it's like a leather from what i can see it looks like a leather shirt that's got like a perforation design on one half of the sleeve and it's also got it running alongside the edges of where the buttons and the seam are it's almost like a perforation but it might, might be like a pattern and also the mat the pants that are on there the jeans look really cool the sizing is brilliant nice flannel there again look at how look at the sizing on these or the fit on these chinos looks incredibly good in it the fit on these chinos is really nice it reminds me of the old school uniqlo chinos from back in the day with the gold buttons i had to wear that i used to wear anyway that are really fucking nice i actually like how he braided his hair actually the way he braided his hair is pretty nice um i like that knit, knit sweater is really cool also uh, what else do we have here we got a great knit sweater actually let me just uh oh look at that i love that snake skin effect shorts that she's wearing there it looks really nice 
um this um jacket this anorak type jacket they've got with a script on the back is really beautiful too it almost looks like a, i'm not sure if it's like a snake skin or like a rocky control that looks cool um these boots i think they're like dana dana boots they look really nice actually those jorts because i think this actual guy he's pulled up his shorts so maybe if this guy with the blazer if he'd be shorts a bit maybe it wouldn't look it. But it's bringing, maybe for the, they wouldn't give you this here he looks really good with the shorts there when he pulls them up so maybe pull them up a little bit it might look better we've also got a nice flannel here with the zip that i'm a big fan of i think that's a under that's an that's a vest isn't it? a mesh vest a mesh a mesh vest i'm not too mad at that plaid hoodie we've also got a nice hoodie there and i also like the style of this and the labeling on the side too you've got a nice stussy label here on the side of this uh striped almost you know picnic table type shirt in the green and white and then you've got an under sh and another button up underneath it styling wise that's quite a good little note i'm not mad at that especially with a little bit of sticking out at the ends here that's not i'm not mad at that fit at all nice big boxy fit and again the jorts the, the jorts or the whatever look pretty decent here um this this kind of hoodie design it looks like an over it looks like a work jacket is also quite nice it's got the same le label that has on the shirt so i guess maybe that's might be it's one of their work shirt division type shirt things and we've also got the hoodie there again all fairly good all fairly great so we've got some new sunglasses that i've just dropped all oh, the clear ones i might have to be me i might have to buy some new ones for the podcast actually those clear ones look really nice as do these vincent glasses too they look really cool too so you've got this shell this was a beach shell wrink crinkle jacket is there in stock at the moment the jean shorts that we saw the, the, they're called big old short washed they're 125 you got some good hats here that sweatshirt that guy was wearing the tonal stripe linen sweatshirt is 150 decent price for that you've got a boxy flat hem crinkled shirt that's 150 nice t-shirt designs here that are 45 like the pricing is always great selection is always fucking brilliant well i love the logo on this work jacket cotton mesh that i think i said so also because it's a mesh it's not just like a basic design okay cool well all in all great um collection from stussy you can't really go wrong one of the main streetwear staples that i'm always wearing always have my wardrobe alongside supreme and a few other bits and bobs so definitely check out stussy spring 2024 available now at all of your supreme or all of your local flopping stussy chapters don't rest don't delay go check them out today anyways my friends that's it for me today that has been the Agostino Zynga show episode number 783 with I your host Agostino Zynga episode number 783 with I your host Agostino Zynga if you've enjoyed the show today make sure you smash the like button down below and I'll be greatly appreciated if you're listening via the podcast apps please make sure you leave me a five star review and all that malarkey that'll be a really 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 appreciated and my tune of the day today my tune of the day today will be the one and only Lancy Fo try again it was my tune today today was from the Lancy Fo album Life in Hell and it's the song called Try Again that's my tune today today for episode number 783 of the Agostino Zinger Show thank you so much for tuning in I'll see you guys very very soon take care be safe peace